Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. Uh, my name is Richard, uh, a.k.a. Bloodworth, and uh, this is the continuation of Sumerian September uh, for September 3rd. So I, I kind of anticipated that I would run one day behind on uh, this one because yesterday was my first day back to work after the summer break. And so I am going to continue going through The Coming of Conan, uh, The Sumerian by Robert E. Howard. And uh, this is specifically the Del Rey uh, three-volume set. And yesterday's story uh, is, uh, is The Phoenix on the Sword. And I had listened to it uh, during my commute to work uh, yesterday. Uh, but I do highly recommend that uh, you read it uh, in, in this form as well, if you're going to do both. Uh, because this here of course, has some really awesome artwork, which I will go into detail uh, with you as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to shift uh, screens here and start talking about it. So here we go with the, uh, with the Phoenix on the sword. So um, what's, what's really interesting about this story is that... Um, and, and really, all of Robert E. Howard's Conan stories in particular is that uh, they're not told in a chronological order. Um, they are told from various points of, of time throughout Conan's career. And this very first one starts off with uh, Conan is already the king of Aquilonia. And you have some really important characters that are introduced during this uh you know, during this story, um, you have the conspirators, all right, to um, to assassinate King Conan, uh, starting with uh, Escalante, who is an outlaw, who has um, who has put together this group of uh, uh, individuals, uh, many of them barons or or uh, even associates of Conan. Uh, in, in his palace itself. And so Escalante has uh, uh, Volmana and Grommel, who is the commander of the Black Legion, and Dion, who is, a, who is kind of a, a minstrel bard uh, poet uh, in the service of, uh, of King Conan, and uh, Ronaldo as well. Escalante believes that he has this enslaved sorcerer that he is going to have power over. And uh, that is in fact Thothaman, one of the most, um, most dangerous of all of Conan's um, adversaries throughout his entire career. And yet we find in this very first story, Thothaman is, um, is virtually powerless. Uh, and under the uh, under the whip, in fact, of Escalante, uh, because he has uh, Thothaman had lost the Ring of Set, which is was the great source of his uh, of his sorcerous power. Um, and then we have the allies who remain true to uh, Conan, and that is uh, Tracello and uh, Tracero. I'm sorry and palantides and then the very mysterious dead for 1500 years epimetrius sorry um epimetrius who is a almost like a um like a sage advisor uh to the kings of aquilonia uh and and really just the the kings of Aquilonia that have a heroic aspect to them and a and a, um, a, a an honorable aspect to them, and so he is going to play prominently in this story uh, by, in fact, placing the phoenix on the sword, which is going to enchant the sword of Conan uh, to be able to. Um, 
to be able to put off and, and even destroy a, uh, a pending doom, uh, a very dark doom that, uh, that is going to face Conan. And so, like I said, I, I really do recommend reading this in the book because the, the interior art, the art that is attached to uh, these are, are just incredible. And I do want to give um, I do want to give the um, credits to these uh, interior arts. Um, and so let's see where we have it. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh no, those are the plates. But anyway, uh, I will continue on. I'll, I'll come back to that the next time. Uh, but um, so here we have the very first. Just a, a view of um, of the capital city of Aquilonia. We have Conan doing some Conan doing some work, uh, very tedious work of, of record keeping and such. Uh, Conan is not a very happy king. It's not something that he really. He never meant to keep the crown, as he says in this story. Um, he he simply just, you know, killed the killed the king of Aquilonia, uh, took his crown, but um, he he never meant to actually take over the throne and and such. But he found himself in the circumstances where uh, he felt an obligation to uh, take the throne and sit on it. Uh, for for some time and he ends up reigning for quite some time um, but he was never happy with that he was never really um, he always felt like it, it, it just wasn't uh, his his desire it might have been his destiny but it certainly wasn't his desire here we have a a picture of Thothaman, um killing the person who actually had his ring of set and so he gets back his ring of set and now he's going to start to work against um escalante and and the others plus and in the meantime he's going to send this demon-like creature to go kill escalante and also to kill Conan um, because that's just something that, uh, you know, would, would advance his means as well. Um, here we have Conan fighting off the would-be assassins. And then the, the story will conclude obviously with Conan nearly killed uh, his surviving um, his surviving uh, and loyal uh, aides are trying to figure out exactly what happened and they're shocked to see that many of these conspirators that were trying to kill Conan uh, were, were members of his own court and uh, the one that they, they were most fearful of, uh, in, in fact, was not like the, the leader or the commander of the Black Dragons or, you know, any of the barons or anything. It was actually Dion. Uh, and Dion was a poet and a, you know, a minstrel or a bard or however you want to describe it. But he was a poet. And they feared Conan... Um, killing the poet because they one had suggested that they killed this guy because he was singing you know he was singing that um you know conan was a tyrant and a you know um he he was not a legitimate king of aquilonia uh but but in fact a, a conqueror a usurper and and they were afraid of killing the poet because they said that Poets have a way of, of speaking to capture the hearts and minds of, uh, of the populace. And, and so they can easily encourage the, uh, the overthrow 
of a uh, of a king. And you would think that that would be like, oh, that's all the more reason for killing him. But if the uh, if a beloved poet is killed by the king, he becomes a martyr, and that might still bring the uprising. So they were they were very um, they were very wary of killing uh, of killing Dion. But then when he made that attack. Uh, on on Conan, on uh, Conan really had no other choice but to kill him. Uh, than the um, you know they they kind of realized that well there's no turning back on that. Uh, so really interesting dynamic and interesting element of that storytelling, in that you know someone who can capture the hearts and minds is actually a little bit more dangerous to a king than than someone who. Uh, you know, who is uh, has the strength of arms or or even sorcery uh, for that matter. So really, really uh, interesting thing. Now, the whole thing about the phoenix on the sword was that the phoenix was a sigil uh, that was placed on Conan's sword. And so even though his sword was broken while fighting one of the uh, one of the commanders that was trying to assassinate him, um, he had enough of the blade and the hilt and the phoenix was still on that portion of the blade so that when he starts fighting this demonic creature um he's able to plunge just the remaining of the hilt uh and and blade into the uh into the creature killing it <coughs> and the phoenix remained on there because uh his uh his uh aides and his counsel were like, don't speak of uh, Epimetrius because he's been dead for 1500 years. And if you speak of him, people might think you're crazy or, or blasphemous or, or something along those lines. And Conan said, no, no, he spoke to me and he put this, uh, he put this uh, symbol on my blade. And so when they looked at the blade and then they can see the the phoenix etch, etching on the on the blade itself they then realized that conan was speaking the truth that he had in fact spoken to epimetrius and and that kind of brings the story to a close and it shows i think it shows to his own aides uh the importance that Conan has as a, you know, as, as the king and that it's his destiny to be there. And, and it's almost like an affirmation of his, um, his support, not just by his, his supporters and his council that remain loyal to him, you know, but also in the almost like the legacy of Aquilonia, which is championed by uh, Epimetrius. And so it's almost like a, you know, a almost deity like figure is is looking over Conan. And so that's, I think, a really important um, thing to bear in mind when you're you're reading about Conan is that you know, much of his destiny uh, is uh, is of cosmic importance almost. You know, it's a it's like there are always larger forces behind the scenes that are involved in Conan's exploits, both for him and certainly against him as well. Uh, so uh, really great story. Um, again, I, I prefer to read it. But it comes off fine in audio as well, and uh, a great installment for Sumerian September. So my next video will probably come a little bit later on this evening just to get caught up. So you'll see September 4th um, tonight. But uh, that will be The Frost Giant's Daughter, which is another great story and one that I will listen on my drive to work today. And then... Um, 
And then when I get home later on this evening, I will record that one as well and post that before, before midnight, basically. And then I will get caught up and be on time with uh, September 5th's installment. So I hope you really enjoyed this and uh, please feel free to uh, like and subscribe and to share these videos out there. I will switch to the opening scene. So I, I hope that you enjoyed my, um, my take and retelling of uh, the Phoenix on the Sword, Conan the Sumerian, for Sumerian September 2024. And this is really my first delving into Sumerian September. I've never heard of it before until uh, just a couple of days ago. And, and so very, very excited to jump in on this. Uh, so you'll have a great one. Take care. Thanks for stopping in.